Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have a very, very special guest speaker this morning. Mr. <clears throat> Roberto Azevedo, who is current Director General of World Trade Organization. Mr. Azevedo is Brazilian by nationality. He served his country and his government in various capacities, particularly in foreign service diplomatic areas. He led his government in leading negotiations in the process of Doha development round and the Mercosur and many other important trade negotiations. So he played a very important key role in the Brazilian government in the area of trade related policy making and particularly trade negotiations. Given this background, the global community elected him to head the WTO at this very critical juncture for the WTO. So we all have very high expectation on him. He took his current post September last year, uh, succeeding Mr. Pascal Lamy, who was with us a few times before. I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to host Mr. Azevedo this morning. I'm sure he will share with us his views and insights about the future of multilateral trading system and the future of WTO. So, uh, <clears throat> he will, uh, actually he has a very tight schedule. Uh, in so, uh, I know it's the first time for him to visit here, but unfortunately he has a very tight schedule. So we have to end uh, very punctually this morning. After this uh, meeting, uh, he is scheduled to have a press conference. Before I invite him, without no further ado, I just want to recognize only a few uh, the uh, persons in presence here this morning. Uh, we have Ambassador Che Se-kyung, who represents Korea in the Geneva mission. Ambassador Che Se-kyung is here. And also the Mr. Uh, Tim Yen, who is Chief of Staff for Director General. He is with you. And also the Minister Kim Chir Su, who used to be the Deputy Director General for WTO is with us, and Minister Kwan, and the National Assemblyman, uh, Mr. Lee, and uh, Ambassador Raphael uh, <clears throat> the, the, from uh, Germany and is with us. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot recognize all uh, the uh, present here this morning. Well, uh, with this a very brief uh, introduction, I would like to invite Mr. Avizedo <coughs> to share his insights and views with us. Please join me in welcoming. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, even before I begin, I would like to convey my heartfelt condolences for the people of Korea and the tragic losses, particularly those of many young students and um, in the recent uh, ferry accident. And I share with you my grief and the grief of those in the WTO. And I want to offer my deepest sympathies to those who lost their loved ones in that tragic accident. I am delighted to be here in Korea, the land of the morning calm. You wouldn't tell it from the traffic. Um, but I would like to start by also thanking President Sagong Yil 
and the Institute for Global Economics for inviting me to speak to such a very impressive audience. Um, and since the successful conclusion of the Bali Agreement at the 9th WTO Ministerial Conference, WTO members have been working very hard to build on the success of that endeavor. In order to reinvigorate the multilateral trading system, and to restore also the role of the WTO in global governance. The success of the Bali package demonstrated once again that we can deliver multilateral outcomes. That was the first such deal since the organization was created in 1995. <clears throat> and that has given the WTO a new and fresh perspective for the future. Korea, of course, played a very crucial role in delivering the Bali outcomes, and the support of the private sector in Bali was critical. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for the support that you all gave in making this breakthrough possible. The business community in Korea and around the world played an absolutely crucial role because we needed the conditions to make that deal possible. Our challenge now is to make the case for going even further to strengthen the multilateral trading system and therefore to help to improve people's lives. The outcomes of Bali have provided a very strong platform for this work. So today I'd like to talk to you about that in particular my vision for the future and for the future of the organization and also the important role that Korea has to play in this future. It is a very interesting time for the global debate on trade and let me begin precisely with this evolving uh, trade landscape that we experience today. Because although Bali has put the spotlight back onto the WTO, a lot of focus, both in the government and in the private sector, is now on the very large uh, regional trade initiatives uh, which are currently uh, being pursued. But I don't believe that this, these, this new env environment is, is there at the expense of the multilateral trading system. In my view, the current work that is going on, on at the plurilateral and regional level is positive, it is welcome, and these initiatives uh, clearly have a role to play. These blocks actually help to build the edifice of global trade rules and trade liberalization. But it is clear also that these initiatives are not sufficient, not on their own. They must coexist with the multilateral system. For one, they leave out a large number of countries, not only the most dynamic emerging economies, but also the poor and the vulnerable. In addition, because this is not about geography alone, many of the big issues can only be tackled at the global level. And therefore, many of the big gains that can, can only be delivered at this level as well. Let me give you an example. The trade facilitation agreement, the trade facilitation agreement that we struck in the Bali package was successful in the WTO because it simply makes no sense to adopt regulations or to streamline customs uh, bilaterally. If you do it for one country, you have to do it for everybody else. And that's the same case, for example, when we talk about uh, financial regulations um, uh, or telecom uh, regulations, uh, which cannot be truly liberalized for just one player. Now, there may be minor things that you can do bilaterally, but it is clear that it is much better to negotiate services regulations globally in the WTO. There are many other examples, uh, and I will give you farming subsidies or fishery subsidies. Uh, they cannot be tackled on a bilateral basis. Another example you know, are the disciplines, for example, on anti-dumping procedures, countervailing measures, safeguards. All of those need a multilateral approach. The simple fact is that the major global challenges for trade, not tariffs, but the major big ones which are behind the border, those can only be addressed globally or multilaterally. Therefore, the different tracks, the bilateral track, regional track, plurilateral track, and the multilateral track, they have to exist together. They are symbiotic. 
But how these regional initiatives are pursued alongside the efforts to revitalize the multilateral trading system will be a very important factor in the global trading system as it evolves in the coming years. And we do need to evolve. The world is changing very rapidly. New players in global economic governance, technological innovation, and new trade patterns are changing, are changing the way that the governments <coughs> use and design trade policies to capture economic gains. The rise of the new global patterns of production is clearly the case. Uh, this new architecture of transborder production can help countries to integrate into the global system, trading in parts and components or performing intermediate tasks um, has clearly lowered the threshold for countries to participate in international trade and to attract investments. However, the benefits of this new integrated way of producing uh, is not automatic. <coughs> and the formula for full integration into the global trade flows, it varies from country to country. While some have successfully uh, participated or managed to participate in global value chains, a very significant number of low-income countries, particularly the least developed countries, are still absent. And of course, the benefits can vary considerably depending on where you are on the value chains, whether you are at the high end or the low end of the global value chains. And the effective implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement, um, which we struck in Bali, and the further reduction of tariffs and trade distortions uh, in the context of the Doha negotiations can help to remove some of the constraints that have prevented some of these countries from participating in the global production chains. But to fully capture the effects and implications of this evolving trend, further analysis is needed uh, to improve our understanding and to help individual countries to harness the benefits. Let me turn now to the multilateral trading system and how it can promote economic growth. International trade, of course, as you, as you know, is still feeling the aftershocks of the global uh, financial crisis. And for the last two years, trade growth has remained around 2.2%. That's still a long way below the historical average. Now, looking ahead, we see a somewhat more positive picture. We expect a broad-based but very modest upturn in the volume of world trade in 2014. We're, we're expecting something around 4.7%. And further consolidation of this growth in 2015, maybe in the order of 5.3%. Uh, That's what we expect. Although this is relatively positive, uh, this outlook still remains modest and the risk of setback remains. Uh, but WTO members are not mere observers of this scenario. They can actually support trade growth, and they can do it in two ways. They can avoid protectionism, and they can improve the disciplines. So our work in monitoring trade developments around the world remains critically important. We must detect trade restrictive measures in their early stages and must discourage their adoption wherever they show up. Second, members, of course, can support growth and strengthening and updating the rules by strengthening and updating the multilateral trading system through reaching new agreements. The success in Bali made this point quite eloquently. The Bali package promises very significant gains for the global economy, delivering growth and jobs once implemented, particularly in terms of the trade facilitation agreement. <coughs> Economists estimate that by implementing that agreement, we could be uh, injecting up to $1 trillion into the world economy by year. By cutting trade bureaucracy, uh, the deal that we struck in Bali could reduce Korea's trade costs for doing business internationally by up to 10%. And significantly, it will help small and medium enterprises to become exporters. This deal will lower the barriers that small and medium enterprises face, helping them to export and to access new markets, therefore helping them to grow and create even more jobs. 
And the evidence also shows that export-focused jobs are generally higher quality jobs and the wages have a premium over other areas of the economy. Bali thus showed us that we can deliver and we can deliver big. We must make sure that Bali is just the beginning and that we can use that momentum to do even more. <coughs> That brings me to uh, one of the most important things that we're doing in Geneva now to strengthen the multilateral trading system. Because as you know, the ministers in Bali sent us instructions and the instructions were to conclude by the end of this year a work program, a very detailed work program on how to conclude the Doha round. And there are some really important issues on the table. Everything actually is now back on the table. but. In my view, in order to make progress, we must tackle at least three of those issues on a priority basis. And those were the three key issues that led to the impasse in 2008 and the subsequent years. And those issues, as you know, are services, agriculture, and industrial goods, or in WTO jargon, NAMA, non-agricultural market access. These issues have not been seriously discussed for over six years. And that is just too long. We have to take a look at them again. We have to look, take a look at them creatively. We just cannot avoid them anymore. And to retain the sense of urgency that we had before in Bali, we have to do it quickly. If we make progress on these issues, particularly these three core issues, everything else, in my view, will fall into place. <coughs> Not easily, nothing is ever easy in the WTO, but it will come together. However, if we don't make progress in these three issues, it's very difficult to make progress anywhere else. So, in a positive mood, I think there is something different in Geneva. I think the atmosphere is different in Geneva because things have changed since those issues were discussed last, six years ago. Since Bali, I have been traveling around the world, so trying to build momentum, political momentum, for what we're doing in Geneva, and to ensure that we can deliver more. And in the recent months, I visited many, many players. I visited the U.S., talked to President Obama. In the EU, I talked to President Barroso and von Rompuy. I talked to President Dilma in Brazil, President Mujica in Uruguay, and many other political leaders, I'm not going to make the list now, I'm meeting your president this, 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 today. Um, and, and these people, these leaders, are both from the north and from the south. And everywhere I go, I sense very strong support for what we're doing. Many of them, however, are clear on one thing. They're clear that they want to avoid a repetition of the failures of the past. They want to make sure that we keep delivering, that we keep being successful, and that's very important for all of us. Yesterday in Korea, I met with the Speaker and members of the National Assembly, uh, the Minister of Trade, <coughs> Industry and Energy, and the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. They all showed very strong support for the WTO and for a successful conclusion of the Doha Round. I am not suggesting at this point in time, and this is very important, I am not suggesting that we should raise or that we should lower the level of ambition of the Bali or of the Doha round. Um, that is too early to tell where we can go. What I am suggesting is that we have to be open-minded, we have to be creative, we have to be flexible, we have to find <coughs> solutions wherever they lead us. As a major player in the WTO and in the multilateral trading system, <coughs> Korea will have a very critical role to play. Korea's support is vital. And as a middle grounder in the Doha negotiations, Korea can help bridge the distance between the developed and the developing countries. Let's take just a brief pause and think a little bit about why do all these things matter. And trade, as you know, is a major force in growth and development. It stimulates innovation and competitiveness. Trade supports the creation of good quality jobs and trade lowers prices and the cost of living, brings in new products and improves the quality of people's lives. Korea knows all that. If there is one country in the world that benefit from trade, that was Korea. In fact, 
Korea is an inspiration for many developing countries. It has achieved its economic success in just a few decades since emerging from conflict. Korea's total trade volume increased from 0.5 billion dollars in the early 60s to over 1 trillion US dollars in 2013. Its GDP per capita rose from 80 US dollars to over 24,000 US dollars. So we're talking about progress that over the past 50 years, Korea's GDP per capita increased by 300 times and its trade volume by 2,000 times with an average of 20% annual growth in exports over three decades. More trade clearly meant more growth and more development for Korea. <coughs> As the seventh largest exporter in the world today, Korea is first in shipbuilding, second in semiconductors, third in electronic goods, and fifth in automobiles. Korea is also home to the world's biggest mobile phone manufacturer, and that's all very impressive. So over the years, the multilateral trading system, as embodied in the WTO, has been very important for Korea. The converse is also true. Korea has become a central player in the multilateral trading system. And therefore, as we approach this critical moment for the trading system, I have to reiterate that Korea's support is critical. Korea has always been a very strong supporter of the multilateral trading system and the WTO. Korea's commitment and engagement was crucial for us to achieve the breakthrough in Bali, and we must keep this engagement. This isn't just about government. This is also, as I said from the outset, about the support of the private sector, which was crucial in Bali, and will be even more crucial in the future. Korea's own experience shows how big and how transformative trade can be. Although it's been only 24 hours uh, since I arrived in Seoul for the first time, and it was really the first time, it was my first visit to Korea. Um, this is a very important trip for me, and I witnessed how dynamic and strong Korea has become. It may be the land of the morning calm, like I said before, but Korea is certainly full of energy and motivation for further growth. So I urge the business people of Korea to share your stories, tell people why trade matters, and explain the difference that it can make to your business, to your lives, and to the lives of the next generation. Korea's economic success, achieved in such a short period of time, supported by trade liberalization, is a model that many aspire to follow. And with your support, we can help others to also achieve better standards of living for their people. So thank you very much for the hospitality, for the warm hospitality that I have received here, and I hope we can continue this engagement for the time that we have left. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Azevedo, for sharing with us your insights and illuminating views regarding the global multilateral trading system and the future of the WTO. The, as you mentioned, the global economy is still suffer, suffering from the last global financial crisis. Particularly, unemployment is prevalent all over the uh, global community and all over the world. The solution can be found in the, the promotion of trade. And the, the trade can be and should be the key to uh, this, resolve this problem. And therefore, uh, WTO is, I would say, the most important global organization at this moment. <clears throat> And the WTO is led by Mr. the Avezedo. Uh, well, thank you very much for again uh, for the uh, initial statement. With this, why don't I invite only uh, two?
two or three questions from the floor, then we have to give uh, the, uh, uh, the time for press conference before he had for the other engagements. And now let me invite uh, the questions from the floor or comments. Oh, everybody's so shy now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, yes, 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 actually. My friends here, okay, thank you. Alan Kimblick has been with uh, Korea for many years and now he's representing all of the uh, uh, the media uh, uh, now, please. Thank you, <coughs> thank you Chairman. Uh, Director General Alvedo, uh, Alan Timblick from the Seoul Times. Um, in a way, you know, it's an inspiring talk that you gave us, but in a way, I wonder whether you are preaching to the choir, because, you know, who would gainsay any of the points that you had made? So I think that's an important question. You say that we've, we've got resistance and we've still got progress to make, but where are these points of resistance and what kind of logic do they use? Are we talking about labor movements? Are we talking about demonstrating farmers clogging up roads with their tractors and their cattle? Or you know, what is it and what is their reasoning? How can they refute any of what you've said today? Thank you. Okay. Why don't I invite uh, other questions or comments? Well, come on, it's a very rare opportunity. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Kim, he is the head of uh, one of the think tanks in Korea. Okay, um, my name is Dohun Kim. As he said, uh, I'm leading a, a one of uh, Korean public think tanks, which is Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade. Um, I, uh, as he said, uh, I cannot <laughs> I cannot uh, help uh, totally agreeing <laughs> what you raised this morning, um, but um, actually I, I I felt a little a, a little bit uh, awkwardness when I heard um, the major three areas you sh we should emphasize for the future. Uh, there was uh, in the order services and agriculture and industrial goods. So I'm, um, because Korea is uh, very much strong in industrial goods, uh, we would we would have uh, had uh, uh, in the order maybe industrial goods and the services and agriculture maybe. But uh, is there any sense when you uh, put those three sectors? In that order, that is um, my curiosity. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. That. <coughs> Good morning. Well, welcome to Korea. Yes. My name is Tong Su Chung. I'm a uh, lawyer in private practice. All, all, all the leading lawyers in Korea. Yes. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> um, I'm glad that you made significant progress in Bali because I think. Prior to that, for almost a decade, WTO was on the verge of uh, becoming almost irrelevant. Uh, in, and so I'm glad that it found its way back uh, to, to make further progress. Uh, there was an important election in India, or I guess the votes are still being counted. And I think India plays an important role as both a developing country, also non-aligned, and in the trade. How do you see the, the outcome of the election and the upcoming change in the leadership of India uh, to affect the WTO's goals, especially toward the fulfillment or the completion of the Doha round? Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. OK. Do you have enough? <coughs> Yes. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all good questions. Uh, let me start in the order that they were, they were asked. Uh, the points of resistance and why. Um, every single country has resistance in some area uh, for different reasons. Um, it's very difficult to find in the WTO one country that supports trade liberalization quickly, fast, deep in all sectors of their activities 
Korea is a case in point. Korea has benefited from free trade immensely over time, but it still has very sensitive sectors. Agriculture is clearly one of them. Um, and that same experience you will see everywhere. Now, I think there is no doubt in most people's mind that uh, opening up the markets and that by being competitive globally, you are improving the economy, you're improving the chances of having sustainable growth. No, I don't think anybody disputes that. But often you have a question of how fast, how quick, how deep. And that changes from perspective to perspective. Now, I think it will be very difficult to try to, to radiograph and make a diagnosis of where the resistance is. The resistance is everywhere. There is not one single point that you bring to the WTO that is consensual. Everybody agrees. Sometimes you have that, everybody agrees, but they need different timing. They need different depth. They need some have more flexibility here, more flexibility there. And that is how, that's why it's so difficult to reach agreements uh, in a multilateral system. It's not impossible, but you have to bridge all these gaps. You have to take care of all these sensibilities to make it work. Now, you can imagine what that means in an organization with 160 countries where you have every single area, pretty much, almost every single area, of trade-related economic activities on the table. It is extremely difficult, but it's not impossible. We have done it before. We are going to do it again. We, I have no doubts about that. We are going to do it again, but we have to be creative and we have to be innovative. Sometimes we'll hit the wall and then we have to step back and find another way. And that's what we're trying to do now. But it's very difficult to say um, uh, where the resistance is going to show up. Sometimes during the negotiations, you, you, you think everything's going fine and, the, and there is an issue, for example, that you think this one, this one is a pushover, this is going to go really easy. And that becomes a nightmare overnight. And you don't even know why. And you, and, and you see the resistance and you're trying to understand what the problem is. And one of the biggest problems as a director general or anyone that has led negotiations is to understand why the problem is there. Because you hear, you hear the argument. You hear the person saying something. This is very difficult because of this, 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 and that. But what he says has nothing to do with his problem. <laughs> nothing. So you really have to go beyond what he's saying and understand the reasons for the problem. And that is the biggest challenge. But it is a very tough question to answer, and I, I, I'm sure I didn't answer it uh, the way you wish I would. Um, but that's the answer I can get. Uh, so. Mm. The second one about the three core issues um, and the order that they were mentioned, next time I will bring a coin and I will flip it <laughs> and see where we end because, or use alphabetical order. I, I have to put an order. I can't say the three at the same time. <laughs> so I have to say one, then the other, then the other. But they are all equally important. Equally important. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. Of course, if I, if I had to put uh, some degree of importance, I would say at this point agriculture is more challenging because of the number of issues that are on the table and because of the importance that the developing world attributes to agriculture. It's a very big issue. Uh, but if you don't solve uh, NAMA, if you don't solve industrial goods, if you don't solve services, then agriculture doesn't move either. So all three have to be uh, tackled at the same time. As for the elections um, in India and the changes in the leadership, it's, it's very difficult to tell. Uh, and, and I myself am not a, a political leader in, in India, so I don't know what's going to happen there or how those changes are going to affect the changes for each particular issue. But I would assume that like in everywhere else, some issues are not going to change because of the election. Uh, India is still India, right? Before and after the elections. Um, the 700 million of, uh, people who voted are still the same that were voting for the previous sector. So the, the millions and millions and millions of farmers small property farmers that they had, they're still there. 
So those concerns are not going to change. And we have to live with that. We cannot, in the WTO, work on the basis of elections. Because every year you have elections somewhere, somewhere big, somewhere important. We had, uh, India had elections just now. Brazil is going to have elections at the end of the year. The, the, the European Union is going to change leadership at the end of this year. The, uh, the US has elections uh, coming up next year. So, you know, if, if you wait for the election cycle to end, you never negotiate anything. What you negotiate has to make sense for those who are in power now and those who will be in power tomorrow. So negotiations have to, to deliver outcomes that make sense over the long run, throughout decades. You cannot be thinking about the immediate future only. If you do that, you never reach an outcome. Never. Never. So, I, difficult to tell, but I, again, I think we have to have a, a long-term perspective uh, from the negotiator's uh, perspective. Well, thank you very much. I'm very sure that there, will be, there are more questions and comments from the floor, but um, unfortunately, we, we have to close this uh, meeting uh, very soon so that he can have a press conference here. Before we do that, I just would like to make just two the comments and observations, not necessarily questions. Uh, first one uh, is that we have to congratulate uh, your leadership uh, under which the uh, very difficult the Bali package was adopted. Uh, we congratulate you and WTO. Uh, I think it is, as you said, is a, a really a, a good start. I just hope that you uh, carry on your leadership to, uh, based on the momentum uh, so that the global economy can enjoy the freer trading environment. Second uh, comment I would like to make is your challenge, one of the big challenges would be how you reconcile the proliferation of the regionalism, all the regional arrangements with your, uh, the multilateral uh, trading system. Uh, the challenge is to make the regional arrangements uh, to become building blocks rather than stumbling blocks for the WTO system. I think this is a big challenge and uh, we need the WTO's uh, real uh, the, uh, leadership, and so we need the big players, uh, particularly, particularly political leadership commitments to, to the uh, multilateral trading endeavors. The third point I'd like to make is that I just uh, would like to invite you to Seoul more often <laughs> <laughs> because you have, whenever you have a message to the global community, I personally been telling actually Pascal Lamy many times, Seoul is the best place in the world because Korea, as you mentioned, exemplify what free trade can do to a country. So whenever you have an important message to the global community, I think Seoul is the best place do that. So whenever you, you're willing to come, we can provide you a forum, maybe we can get 500, 600, whenever people. And really, I'm very serious about it, and I'm sure the press corps here will agree with me, Seoul is the best place. So please come more often to Seoul. <laughs> well, please. Uh, thank, thank you. you.